Hi, my name is Wally. I am a dancing and MP3 playing toy sold by the Walt Disney Corporation. I am also a sales technology enthusiast, and this is why my friends at YCRMDoesNotWork.com hired me. Please bear with me, I am not a trained public speaker. My friends hired me because I am cute, and they could not afford the services of a real actor or a dot com nerd. This presentation is the second part of our two part case study about the reasons why CRM fails in mid sized businesses. In the first section of our case study, we attempted to show why CRM fails through a short story. In order to highlight the human dynamic that exists or may come into play during and after a CRM implementation, we turn to fiction, specifically to the analogy of family. We will now explore the reasons why the CRM implementation failed in its real context. So what happened in our story? Data cleanup and migration from legacy systems is a real budget killer. Mid-size organizations tend to vastly underestimate the complexity of the task. By the time they have installed a CRM system and migrated their data, their resources are depleted and momentum is lost. The executives who initiated the project abandon it to employees who can afford to spend time on details but who lack the authority to bring the project to completion. The implementation stalls. Technology has gobbled up all the allocated resources and time. Nothing is left for the two other pillars of any successful software implementation, processes and people. Here's how things unfold. The role of trust. Trust is a double-edged sword. Because CRM implementations live by trust, they also die from the lack of it. Here is why. Mid-size organizations tend to invest in back-end systems, operations, and accounting before they invest in CRM. The managers who oversee the implementation of back-office systems are detail-oriented. They are production managers or accountants whose job it is to craft processes and conform their employees' activity to these processes in a top-to-bottom fashion. Their procedures are the legal bond by which the organization runs. Companies invest in CRM when they realize that they must better control and integrate their front office activities to become more customer-centric. CRM implementations decisions are made by sales or general managers whose job it is to process information that comes from their employees and from the market in a bottom-to-top fashion. Whereas their back office colleagues were more detail-oriented, sales and general managers are more relationship and bottom-line driven. As against production managers or accountants who base their decisions on first-hand facts, they must base theirs on partial information and on trust. This is how trust plays an important role in the life and death of CRM systems. When sales and general managers initiate their CRM project, they do not foresee all the implications that their decision will have. They simply trust that CRM will help. They have limited information, limited experience, and limited time. They have no choice but to entrust their CRM initiative to a vendor, an employee, or a consultant. This trust carries the project until the end of the technology phase of the implementation. When the CRM system is in place, the very people that these managers rely upon to get their information and to get their job done start to react to the system and to the constraints that it imposes or may impose on them. If at this stage users are not trained and processes are not solidly defined, universally approved, or firmly imposed, people voice their criticism and start to opt out, explicitly or implicitly. The trust that sales and general managers have in their own staff weighs in against the trust that they had placed in the implementers and in the system. If by now, as is often the case, the consultant or implementer has moved on to another mission, the initiators of the CRM initiative are left with no other choice but to distance themselves from the system alongside its most powerful opponents. Procedures are necessary but alien to the way sales departments operate. Once the technology phase is complete, once resistance has built up and once the implementer is gone, success rarely materializes. Like any other enterprise software, and more so because CRM processes a lot of unstructured data, CRM systems can be used or misused in many different ways. For CRM information to be shared effectively, and for reporting and automation to work, data must be entered and used with consistency, so procedures must exist to guide users, and users must be trained to follow them. The problem is that because procedures, integration, and automation are usually alien to the way front office departments operate, the initiators of the CRM project often fail to realize how critical it is to define processes and to formalize them in writing. So they do not. They assume that technology suffices, and that using a CRM is akin to filling out web forms or entering orders in an accounting system. With processes undefined, employee support soon collapses. Writing procedures and getting managers and employees to sign up on them and on the new CRM system is not an easy thing to do. Sales and general managers have neither the time nor the inclination to delve into the details of a complex system and to write lengthy instructions. Employees do not like to read instructions either. Managers usually rule by verbal communication and short memos, sometimes in a more reactive than proactive manner. Unlike back office workers, sales, marketing, customer service, product managers, and support employees are not used to procedures and to the rigor that enterprise software imposes on users. If anything, they are used to smaller, specialized, non-intrusive applications that they control individually or at the team level. Integration is not a big concern for sales and front office employees. Front office employees do not depend on other departments' data as much as their back office colleagues do. When an R&D engineer modifies an engineering files, he knows that this will have an impact on other departments and employees, inventory, production, purchasing, QC, etc. There is no such awareness and domino effect in front office departments. 
front office employees process a lot of unstructured information and exchange little data with others. Integration is not a primary concern for them. Their knowledge of the needs of other departments is often limited. Their relations with their peers are generally informal, lightly structured, dependent on goodwill, and sometimes even competitive. Competition among employees, teams, or departments is sometimes sought as a way to stimulate activity and to collect and verify information. As a corollary, secrecy can be used as a mean to protect oneself and retain power for both employees and managers. Obligation to perform versus obligation to comply. Front office employees are valued by their peers and managers for the results that they achieve individually. They are not valued by their peers and managers for their adherence to set methods and their flawless contribution to the work of a team. They are not valued by their peers and managers for the means that they employ or for what they do for others, and not either for their compliance to rules and recommendations. Sales and general managers will always tend to favor a salesperson who brings a lot of sales, but bends the rules over one who is compliant, but sells less. They will tend to be indulgent with the first, but not with the second. Micromanagement worries. If anything, sales and general managers are wary of interfering with the means employed by their staff because they fear being associated with their employees' failures. The power of sales and general managers is dependent upon their ability to judge performance. If they cannot do it because they share responsibility in their employees' failure, they lose their ability to do their job, they lose their own relevance. Likewise, sales employees fear that management meddling in their activity could result in failure for which they might be unjustly blamed or sanctioned, be it because of management error or simply because they are wasting their time in front of a computer. Contract versus Diktat Managers and their teams are linked by contract-like or objective-based understandings and positive motivation. They are not bound by instructions and monitored by a quality system as back office workers often are. Front office employees are the link between an organization's management and its market. Sales and general managers tend to treat them as they treat their customers, with respect, openness, clarity, and a measure of friendliness through mutual commitments. All this makes user adoption virtually impossible. In effect, procedures, integration, and automation are so irrelevant to sales and front office departments and to their value system that it makes the adoption of enterprise software by these departments very difficult. Whatever the system and whatever its merits, front office employees do not need it. They do not need a multi-user system to send email, log appointments, and track opportunities or tickets. They can do this with paper or single-user applications. Supervisors can benefit from a multi-user application, but they do not need a multi-department system to manage their teams. Front office employees and their supervisors have no incentive to use enterprise software, as it is at odds with the value and rewards framework in which they operate and which their management supports. Unlike their back office colleagues, sales and front office employees do not benefit directly from enterprise software. Back office workers and accountants process structured data that is for the most part generated by other employees or departments and or is destined to be used by others. They benefit directly from the convenience and reliability delivered by enterprise software. Their work would be painstakingly slow without it. Their supervisors need software for compliance issues and they use it to shape and enforce the processes that employees execute. Both back office workers and managers share the benefits of enterprise systems. This is not the case with CRM. Most of the new benefits that CRM brings are benefits for the top management of the company. Those benefits are 1. Better market visibility and employee accountability through company-wide, real-time record sharing, reporting, and alerts. 2. The elimination of duplicate data entry among employees and departments, and concomitantly, the reduction of errors through the sharing, duplication, and conversions of records. A sales lead becomes a contact, a quote becomes an order, etc. 3. The speed gained and the reduction of errors achieved through the automation of repetitive and complicated tasks previously performed manually, quoting, expenses, etc. 4. The ability to easily collaborate on processes, records, documents, etc. 5. The better retention of customers and the early identification of opportunities through the integration of departments, office locations, etc. 6. The enforcement of better business practices through process automation within and across department boundaries. 7. The retention of knowledge in a shared and exhaustive repository rather than simply in the heads, hard disks, or phones of employees who can't switch.